What is up, Algebra 2? Welcome to another unbelievably amazing math note video. I'm doing them for you. I hope you're getting something out of these. Um, they are super fun to make, and I hope they're just as much fun to watch. Hey, listen. Um, I just was thinking of a few things, uh, things that I'm missing. I know I've already referenced Vera telling me the problems. Um, Andrew, buddy, you watch these videos. I'm missing talking to you about football. Um, one thing that came to mind, I hope you're putting as much time into these videos and math as you may potentially be putting into video games. So just from Mr. A to Mr. Andrew, um, miss you there, buddy. Drew, I hope you are not every day waking up at like 11 or noon, which was one of the reasons why I gathered you wanted me to post tests and Zooms later in the day. Maybe we'll work on that. Um, all right, don't want to make fun of you guys. Uh, Ashlyn, thank you so much for those messages. Clink, high five. Um, Casey, uh, I, I miss you. Um, you're so quiet, you're so patient. And um, yeah, I just wanna let you guys know that, that I'm thinking of you. I wanted to put a few names in this video just to keep you awake, keep you watching. Stay with me. Uh, we got section four coming at you today. We're talking about compound events. I know these videos are a little bit long. My javelin at the beginning doesn't help it. I get that, but there's a lot of words in these things. So you gotta pay close, close attention, all right? So in this one, you gotta copy four key terms and there are two main concepts. That's gonna be coming at you on page 819, mutually exclusive events. That's what we're talking about, as well as inclusive events on page 820. So that's what we're talking about for main concepts. The key terms, those are always highlighted, so I need you guys to look those up, write those down. Anytime they're giving you these words, you need to know what they mean. These words are gonna be on your test. You're gonna have to know what they are talking about, how to use them, all that stuff. Um, I'm gonna be off to the side here. We're gonna work out 1A and 1B first. This info right here is all for 2A and 2B. So you're gonna to wanna to copy all this stuff down. Um, all right, let's jump into 1A. So they're gonna give us some information for 1A, presented a lot of it already right here. So they're giving us that each student casts one vote for senior class president, 25% voted for Hunt, 20% voted for Klein, and 55% voted for Villa. A student from the senior class is selected at random. By the way, didn't know if I mispronounced that. Could be Villa, could be Vila, who knows, I do math. I guess I don't do words, so there you go. Um, all right, for 1A, the question is, explain why the events voted for Hunt or voted for Klein and voted for Viola are mutually exclusive. The reason why they are all mutually exclusive, here's the whole justification in one sentence, it's because every student can only cast one vote. So they are all mutually exclusive because that means if you cast a vote, for Hunt, that's it, that's your vote. You cannot go back on that and cast another one for somebody else or cast a vote for all three. So they are all mutually exclusive to each other, meaning you could only vote for one of these senior class presidents. So that is for 1A. The answer here is because you can only cast one vote for one person. All right, let's move on to 1B. Uh, we got our info presented here, 25% for Hunt, 20% for Klein, 55% for Viola here, Viola Villa, who knows. All right, add it all up, you got 100%, okay? Look a little further into the question here, and they're going to say, what is the probability that a student voted for Klein, right here, there's 20, or Viola, that would be 55, put those together, it's 70 percent so that's what we are looking for here for 1b simple enough for that okay so that gets us through 1a and 1b 
Now let's jump into 2A and 2B. Here's the info that you're going to have to know to do these problems. Um, a lot of this probability stuff deals with uh, maybe like a playing card or dice or flipping coins and you got to know a little bit about each of their backstories to understand how to do the problem. So in a deck of cards you got 52 cards. There are three face cards for every suit. There are four suits. You got hearts, you got diamonds, you got clubs, you got spades, and the last piece is there are 13 cards per suit. All right, what I mean by cards is you're looking at the numbers 2 through 10, and then you got what, jack, queen, king, ace, but that all together, you got 13 cards. Okay, so you're going to need this info to complete 2A and 2B. All right. So for 2A, the question that we're looking at here is drawing a king or a heart. All right, so what we have is a king or a heart, and that's going to get us to a king or a heart. There are four total king or a heart. There are four kings. That's how we get four, and then 52 total cards. So that's the first thing. By the way, you really have to focus on inclusive events, all right? The inclusive events, that's these guys right here. The purpose that we have, there's a keyword or that comes in, all right? And that is you have a king, as they say, or a heart. So we're going to come up with the probability of how many kings we can get. Four out of 52. We're going to add that to then how many hearts we could get. And remember there's 13 cards per suit. There are 13 hearts out of a total again of 52. Then the inclusive would be can't we have a king that is a heart? So we have to subtract the one occurrence where you could have the king that is a heart. And there is only one king of hearts. So what we're doing here is you're saying you could get a king, you could get a heart, but we got to subtract the one chance that you get the king of hearts. Okay? And then when you work all of this out here, let's see, you got my little cheat sheet. We are gonna get four over 13. Now, a trick that I wanna show you guys using the calculator, just so that you're aware, all right? So we got our nice little calculators over here. If you put this exact thing into your calculator, you got one of the older models like I do, you would want to put all of these fractions in parentheses, okay? And when you put all those in parentheses and then you hit enter, your answer is going to be this decimal, all right? Which to you doesn't really mean a whole lot because we're looking for our final answer to be a fraction. So here's what you do if you want to take that decimal and convert it to a fraction. Um, all right, so you're going to go to the math button right here push math and the first thing under math I see for number one is an arrow and then the word fraction or F-R-A-C you're gonna hit enter and then hit enter again and that's gonna convert the decimal that you just got into a fraction does it all for you alright so let's make sure that we understand this process and how to use the calculator to convert decimals to fractions alright 2B, the question we're looking at here is it says drawing a red card. All right, well, a red card that's going to be hearts or it's going to be diamonds. All right, so if you have 13 cards per suit and they're talking about two suits, then you're going to have 26 possible cards two suits each suit has 13 that's how you got 26 again put it over 52 total cards and then the other part of it or a face card all right how many face cards do we have there are three
face cards, I should say per suit. Now how many suits do you have? You have four suits. Three times four, getting us 12 total face cards. And then you have to do the subtraction part. This is where you have the overlap, okay? So how many face cards do you have that would be a red card as well? Six. All right, now here's how you know that. If you have three face cards per suit, and we're talking about using two suits, that would be three times two, that's giving us our six. Work out all this, again, you can plug it into the calculator, put them in parentheses, hit math, convert that decimal to a fraction, and you're gonna get eight over 13. Okay, so that covers us on 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. I'm gonna erase the board. We're gonna move into examples three and examples four. We're gonna need a little more space for those. All right, back at you. Number three, here we go. Okay. Make sure that you guys are always following in the book with the video. So number three, I'm telling you guys, for guidance on number three, you're gonna wanna take a quick read, maybe not so quick read, on example problem number three at the top of the page on 821. All right, I got a whole little diagram we're gonna talk about here. So of 160 beauty spa customers, 96 had a hair styling and 61 had a manicure. All right, so what I want us to show is yes, we have 160 total, all right? But then they break it down a little further. We have 96 that did something with their hair. We have 61 that are rocking a mani, okay? You know, mani, get a petty, who knows, all right? And then they're gonna go a little bit further. But if we take a pause, if you add these two numbers together, are you actually getting 160? No, that's important for you to understand. We're gonna learn using kind of this idea of a Venn diagram. Remember Venn diagrams? That's when you're gonna have circle, circle. There's an overlap. There's people that might try a little bit of both, people that might just do one, people that might just do the other. This is something that happens in this problem. Okay, so we look a little bit further. There were 28 customers who had only a manicure. So let's break this number off here. We have 28 that only got the Manny. All right, but if we take 61 minus 28, that's gonna get us 33. Now this number 33 is special because that means that 33 must have done both. So that means that you're gonna have 33 people getting the mani and 33 people getting something with their hairstyle. That tells us that that other part of the 96 means that 63 only did something with their hair, 33 did something with hair and mani, and 28 did just the mani. All right, so now if we add these numbers together, that's gonna get us 124 customers did something with the manicure, maybe both, or the hairstyle. But remember at the beginning, 160 total customers went into the salon. So there are extra customers that are not a part of this problem. Look back now, what's the final thing they're asking? What's the probability that a customer had a hairstyle or a manicure? Well, 124 out of 160 total customers would reduce to 31 
over 40. This is the probability that someone who went into the hair salon of the 160, a 31 out of 40 chance that they did something with the manicure or the hairstyle. I want you to take the time to copy this down, rewatch it again and again, because you gotta understand this process. All right, there's number three. Let's take a look at number four. All right, number four. Okay, number four, bottom of page 821. This right here, you're gonna want to read example four to do our check the progress version of number four. So, here we go. In one day, five different customers bought earrings from the same jewelry store. The store offers 62 different styles. Find the probability that at least two customers bought the same. I'll tell you at the beginning, we cannot immediately jump in and just figure out about those two customers. You have to do kind of a backwards version where what we're gonna do is figure out what all five could do and then subtract to get what the two could do. So this is how you would set it up. For starters, if you read some of those key words in there, this is going to be permutation, not a combination, a permutation because order is gonna matter. Those two people do matter. And we're gonna put the biggest number, 62 in front, 62 total possible earrings. And we're gonna calculate for all five. Remember, we can't immediately jump into the two. We gotta calculate for the five and then subtract to get those two. All right, and what we're gonna do here is actually do a one minus that number, and then we have to divide, this is why I want you to really read example number four directly above it, and you're gonna to want to divide for the total number of those five customers, 62 to the fifth power. Now, let's expand this out and see how it actually helps to start crossing some things out. So, this is gonna be, by the way, here's a little trick. Remember when you're doing those permutations? If you want the fast method, this is really saying 62 factorial, but only five times, and here's what I mean by that. I just mean 62, 61, 60, 59, 58. All right, so the 62 factorial technically would have me going from 62 all the way down to one. That's crazy. The five right here just says, just do the first five. So there's one, two, three, four, five. So it's like 62 factorial, only the first five. Then underneath it, we're gonna have that 62 to the fifth power. Now again, use the calculator. Don't waste your time trying to figure out all of this longhand. And this is going to funnel down to really one minus 0.84 seven, six. You'll notice I went a little bit further on that decimal to make sure we have an accurate calculation. And when you get this, that's going to equal a 0.1524. All right, this is the answer. This is what they're looking for. We had to perform the subtraction to get the two customers, but we couldn't immediately go into that. You had to calculate the full five and do subtraction to get that leftover. The leftover is the two customers. All right, so there you go. Leave that problem up there on the board. Again, you guys make sure that you are watching, re-watching. Do it as many times as you need to. I know these videos are long because that is what is required of you 
to understand the material. All right, see you guys in the next video.